Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Smart Man, Smarter Woman, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And thank you very much for joining us today. I am Steve Lotz. And I am Juliet Aurora. And we are your co-hosts. And before I introduce uh, today's special guests with an S, let's hear from our wonderful co-host, that smarter woman herself, Juliet. How are you doing today, Juliet? I am excellent, thank you. And normally I take a couple minutes, you know, to chit chat with you and and say something maybe humorous. I'm not going to do that today because I think that the the guests that we have on today's show are living my dream life. So I want to spend as much time as possible learning how they did that. So I don't want to talk about anything else. So over back to you, Steve. Okay. So that was a hint for me not to be so long winded this time and just get straight to it. Is that what you're saying? A very subtle hint. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, I did get the hint. That's great. Well, as Juliet said, we have a great show for you today with another one of our two for one deals where we've got a husband and wife and uh, business partners, Bonnie and John Wagner Stafford, and they are the co-founders of Ingenium Books. But that's not the reason we got them on the podcast. They actually have a great story that I think, well, I don't want to get too much into it yet. So let's bring our guests on to the show, Bonnie and John, and welcome, guys, and thank you for joining us today from Mexico. Hey, you're welcome. It's super good to be here. Nice to be talking to you guys and nice to meet you. Thanks for having us. Oh, our pleasure. So uh, uh, as Juliet said, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. As I said, mentioned, not only did Bonnie and John have a great story that I think we may all be just a little bit jealous of, but because we're going to talk about, first of all, one of the challenges some entrepreneurs have and that is getting the book published. But we're probably going to get to that a little bit later. Maybe let's start out before we get to that. If Bonnie and John, you could maybe share with us, you know, who you guys are, what you do, who you help, and even maybe where you do it from. Perfect. It's all you. Yep, that sounds great. So I'm Bonnie Wagner Stafford, and you I'm are... John Wagner Stafford. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we 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 both have double barreled last names because when we got married, however many years ago that was, ten, eleven, coming up eleven, I don't know. Um, we each took the others maiden name. And that was John's idea. It wasn't my idea. So my maiden name is Wagner and John's is Stafford. And so we are both Wagner Stafford. That tells you a little bit about the partnership mindset that we have, which I think really helps us both in our business and in our lives. So Ingenium Books is the publishing company that we are co-founders of. And we we are a hybrid publisher of nonfiction, of outstanding nonfiction. And what we we specifically empower professional women to bring more meaning to their lives by helping them write, publish, and market their books so they can grow their influence create more impact and enjoy a greater sense of accomplishment. So one of the next questions we usually get is what the heck is a hybrid publisher? And just to, you know, get that out of the way, there's the, there's been a huge evolution in the publishing industry over the last decade, decade and a half. And there is self-publishing options all over the, you know, Mm. authors have never had so many options and choices in front of them. And that can be very empowering or it can be very overwhelming. So you can do it yourself. You can look for a traditional publisher with that wonderful notion of getting an advance. And then, you know, you, all you do is write your book and the publisher does everything else. And then maybe you'll get a royalty check a couple times a year. And that's, increasingly a pipe dream. And then there's hybrid publishers in the middle where we are a little bit of both. We publish professional quality nonfiction in a partnership where the author invests a little bit up front for a greater share of the returns on the back end. And the the books that we publish are indistinguishable from anything that's traditionally published in terms of the quality, both the editorial and the packaging and sales. So that gives you a little bit about, about the company and what we, what we do. How we got here is quite something else <laughs> altogether. 
<laughs> yes, and we definitely want to hear your story of how you got there. So Steve wasn't going to allude to any of it. So I'm going to just jump in so that we can jump into this story here because it's an amazing story. So you both used to live in Canada. Yes. And now permanently full-time live in Mexico. Yes. And live as a combination between Mexico on land and Mexico on a boat. That's, That's correct. correct. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm sure our audience is like, what? What? What, what do you mean? <laughs> And you are still running a thriving business. Yes. Yeah. And made the decision. So how long ago did you move, uh, make this this big life change? Well, well, the departure from Canada was um, at the end of August of 2015. But the preparation started probably a good two years in advance. Although it what it, it it started probably even a couple of years before that when we were thinking okay we really wanted we don't want to be in the winter anymore mm -hmm. we're we're you know my knees are shot I can no longer downhill ski so that was essentially the end of my pleasure with snow and shoveling just wasn't cutting it so we were like why don't we try to figure out how we create a scenario for our lives where we can be six months somewhere warm when it's cold in Canada and then be in Canada the other six months. So we started sort of the downsizing journey then. And that aha moment happened after we had come back. Well, we had, we were on a vacation in Mexico and we were looking at one another going, why aren't we living here? I don't understand. We didn't, didn't want to go back home. Where didn't we? And then after we got home, Within the first week, we were in our commute in the car and we were, you know, drive an hour and a half each way. And so as John was driving and I had nothing to do again while we we're driving, commuting to our corporate jobs in downtown Toronto, I did the math on how much time we were spending in the car in our commute to work. And not including sleep time, so factoring only productive time, we were each spending eight weeks a year in the car. Mm. And wow. Yeah. And I had just turned 50. And I was like, no way do I have eight weeks a year to spend sitting in the car. There's no way. And we immediately... That was at the end of February, and we downsized out of our big house in Vaughan three months later, moved into a condo, very tiny condo in downtown Toronto, and then within a couple of years, we actually left Canada. And the, the decision to come to Mexico was partly based on, you know, we had done a couple of other trips to see what it felt like we were in Costa Rica, and Mexico just had a it had a better feel about it. The, it. You know, it was a little bit cheaper. It was close enough to Canada to still get back to see our kids. So that was the reason that we, we chose Mexico. And originally, we thought we were coming to Mexico to buy a cheap little beach house. And that then we were thinking, you know, at some point in the future, we would, we would buy a boat. And that was going to be part of the future plan. And then when we first got to Mexico... On we, the Atlantic side. On the Atlantic side, over on the Yucatan Peninsula, we had spent about six weeks. We looked at every piece of property within the budget range that we had set, and we actually had an offer in on one little place. And, of course, the real estate rules in Mexico were very different than they are in Canada. And so we had no response at all from the property owner. Two weeks went by. We had no response to our offer, and we're going, oh, my God, what's happening? And it was wonderful that that we did not have a response because what we realized as we waited is that we were now tired of this area and we kind of went oh my god what are we doing we're just about to exchange the same property ball and chain that we had in Canada for the property another property ball and chain we don't want to be tied to that and so we kind of went oh we have to switch this up we have to buy the boat first so we withdrew our offer and John, of course, he's always looking at sailboats. And we looked at several sailboats before we left Canada. So John said, you know where? We got to go to San Carlos on the Pacific side. That's the best place to buy a boat in Mexico. So we gathered up our two cats and our guitar and our four suitcases, which was everything we left Canada with. And we flew across and arrived in San Carlos and bought our sailboat about three weeks later. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I want to interject here and, and kind of stay in the the spirit of 
entrepreneurship oh, yes, and, and, and helping entrepreneurs out. One of the important things that worked well for us in this process in the very first stages is that we recognized who we are, what, what type of people we are, and, and what we recognize is that we do not like to stay in one place for very long. Yes. And, and today, five years later, after moving from Toronto to Mexico, we still don't like to stay in one place for very long. So by recognizing that early in this decision-making process, it has played out in a way that has benefited us tremendously because we've made all the right decisions or the, the, the decisions have turned out to be good decisions uh, in hindsight because of that. Yeah. Wow. So one of the things that you said was that when you started thinking about this journey, you we're thinking of doing, you know, six months somewhere warm and six months in Canada, which is typically the way that most people will will address it and most people will will try and formulate their lives. So how did you make that switch from let's find somewhere warm to go for six months a year to, okay, let's move somewhere permanently uh, for 12 months a year? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And I can't think of any other way to answer it except that it was economics. So we did not have and did not want to have a piece of property that we were still tied to in Canada. We wanted the complete flexibility. So I think it's fair to say that when we left Canada that first August, we actually didn't know whether we were going to come back in six months and we were kind of leaving that open. But, you know, as John said, it's, you know, no grass grows under our feet ever anywhere and really never has. I mean, Mm -hmm. I've moved more than 50 times by the time we made this move. So I'm just used to in my life picking up and trying something new going. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I think I've moved four times. (laughs) Yeah. There's a, there's a book in that, by the way, you know, moving 50 (laughs) times, in 50 years yeah, yeah. not many people have done that so there's a book in definitely yeah. absolutely but yeah. but and you guys probably know someone who could help publish yeah, yeah we probably <laughs> do we probably do but this speaks to one of the things that we were talking about just before we started to record which is you know as entrepreneurs we're all familiar with the necessity of embracing risk mm-hmm. and and as entrepreneurs who embrace risk, there are still shades of gray in there. You know, every entrepreneur is not comfortable with the same degree of risk. And I think that John and I are simply more comfortable with a high degree of risk in many areas. So so leaving Canada, one of the reasons I think people come back for six months, it relates to social services, health co- health coverage, Right. And and you've got to, you know, you've got to have a passion for the summer times in Canada, which are arguably gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And for us, it was like, OK, we want to create something different. We want to have a different experience. And so we're just going to let that happen, mm-hmm. if that makes. Sense. OK. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, that, um, that's great. Go ahead, Juliet. So before we get into what the benefits are or what the upside is. Can you tell us what maybe was one of the most difficult things about making this decision? Yes. Excellent question. So I think this is why, why people might not do this. This is the kind of thing that is arguably very difficult. So one of the things, you know, we got rid of all our furniture and we had two pianos and we're musicians and we sang in the Toronto Mendelssohn choir and we had all this, all this stuff. And we had, you know, the leather reclining furniture in the living room and we had, you know, on the car car and you know, all that stuff. So we, we had to get rid of, and we chose to get rid of all of our material possessions that I, 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 I mentioned, we left Canada with four suitcases, our two cats, and a guitar, and that was it. And we left nothing in storage. My son had a couple pieces of art that I didn't want to part with, and that was it. But one of the things that I had to do that was extremely difficult 
was I had to go through and get rid of a steamer trunk full of photos from my mother who had passed away about 15 years prior to us leaving. And, you know, her, her, she was young when she died and it was traumatic as anybody who's lost their parent can attest to. And so I had all these photos and I had to spend, I spent about seven hours in one weekend looking at every single picture, putting them in one pile. This is the pile for digitization and this is the garbage pile. And I took three garbage bags full of my mother Mm -hmm. out to the curb. And what I had to, and I chose to, what, what I realized is that my mother lives within me. The memories of my mother can never be taken away. My mother is not the photo. My relationship with my mother is not the photo. And so that was part of that process. But that is a very, you know, there are, we are material creatures thanks to the society that we've created in, in, in North America and Western society. And, you know, giving up that material connection, I think is, is probably what keeps most people from doing what we've done. We will continue with our conversation right after this message from a friend of the show. AIS Solutions is an award-winning cloud accounting firm serving small business all across Canada. If you want to migrate to a powerful and effective paperless accounting system and get your financials wherever you are, whenever you want them, then contact AIS Solutions team of trained professionals today at www.aissolutions.ca. And now back to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. I would agree with that. I can't even imagine packing up our life into four suitcases. <laughs> you know, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that comes to mind when Bonnie's talking about that is another part of the decision making and the journey that we went through in the early stages of this was believing in the universe and, and having faith that we know what we're doing. We're taking a decision and we're, we're happy with, with, with having trust in ourselves and trust in the universe to, you know, allow things to play out as they will and will in, in turn allow us to react to things as they come forth. Yeah, we knew where we wanted to go without having to know what every little detail was going to be. Yeah. Right. Which I no, that's and I guess for most... Mm-hmm. And I guess for most people, I mean, if you were to think about it, what is the worst that could have happened? You hated it and you went back to Canada. Exactly. Yes. And you bought a house. Yep. yep. So so if you, you know, I, I would never think of it that way. For me, it would be, oh, my God, I'm selling all my stuff. But, but realistically, the worst case is I can want. buy it all again. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think you have to reach a point, though, too, that, uh, that it, it appears, you know, that it is just stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the, the problem we have, I think, for many of us, and I'm certainly guilty of it, is we get too attached to stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's why it becomes difficult, as Juliet said, you know, to imagine packing up our lives because it's packing up our stuff yeah. into four suitcases. And I think probably one of the first things that has to happen is you've got to get your head past that, you know, that it is just stuff. And like you say, have faith in the universe that, you know, uh, your happiness is not tied to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mm -hmm. but I think that that is a very difficult thing for many of us to do. So uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's a financial component too here in that somebody, some, some, some of us might think, Oh gee, all the money that we would spend, on flights and this and that to have it just turned around again is a negative is, is, is not the right thing to be doing. But, you know, you can also consider it that that's, that was the way to test it. And if it's that cost to test what might've been the best thing in your life, why not? And and it ends up being not that very costly. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say that uh, your happiness isn't tied to your stuff. Neither is your identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually more 
Yeah, that that's what draws. It's our identity is tied with our stuff, whether it's happiness or misery. It's 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 our it's our identity. So we don't have much. No, I think yeah, no, I think you're right, Bonnie. I think that's exactly what it is. I, um, and we're you know we're we're guilty of that, right? That our identity becomes uh, connected with stuff, becomes connected for a lot of us, right? With our business, right? We are what our business is, which which really is nonsense. <laughs> But it happens, particularly with entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. And you did say one statement before we started, before we went live, that I would like you to share with our audience, because I thought it was so important as to why you started your business and how you started your business versus building your life around your business. So if you could share that, Mm -hmm. I think it is very profound for our audience. Happy to. So we have now we have a business that supports the life that we want we don't have a life that works around the business and it is because of that decision making process that we went through leading up to our departure from Canada was we want to create this kind of a life and our business was created after we left to fit the life that we want as opposed to coming up with a business idea and then making our lives fit around the business idea And, you know, I I know some fantastic entrepreneurs who, serial entrepreneurs who create these fantastic businesses and then say, oh man, but I want to be doing more of what you're doing, but they continue to create these businesses that have bricks and mortar and the requirement to be in a physical space. And and, are very successful and and are making lots of money. Exactly. But they still have that, oh, I want to be, you know doing what you're doing. So our, our, our business matches the life we want as opposed to the other way around. Hmm. And that is so, so rare because most entrepreneurs build their business and then fashion their life around what their business needs, especially as they're building it. Yeah. And even though you started your business after you made the move, you did it the other way around, which I think I, I, certainly I, I, do, I do have to ask the question, why publishing? Why oh, great, did you great choose question. Yeah. Yeah, great. the business you chose? Yeah. That is a fantastic question. So I'm a former journalist. I spent 15 years as a television and radio reporter, largely in Western Canada. And then the next little over a decade, I was with the Ontario government in communications, always responsible for editorial projects. So I've always you know, story and working with words and, you know, editorial stuff has always been a fabric of who I am. And when we left Canada, I was ghostwriting books for other authors. And so we had, you know, and it was kind of like, all that'll be a little bit of income that comes in and I can kind of, you know, I can keep doing that and we can keep doing our other things. And John is a serial creative entrepreneur you want to talk a little bit about what you Yeah, j- just briefly f- with, with me. I've spent most of my entrepreneurial days uh, leading creative teams in the television and entertainment business. And um, video games. And video games as a producer of sound. And uh, so I was leading, you know, teams of, of 11 people or 160 people with all varied budgets, producing the soundtracks for film, television, television advertising, and video games. And, you know, from from that, one of the qualities, uh, I'm just going to pinpoint something here. One of the qualities that I possess, which allowed me to do that in that entertainment business in the time is that I find solutions to problems. And Bonnie has just recently renamed me the solution superhero. Because I create problems. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. It's a perfect combination. Yeah. And so my my background as an entrepreneur is in in that. (laughs) managing projects and teams and getting the job done for, uh, you know, higher power, a producer or the owner of the film or or, or whatever. So then the connection between there's our background and and we worked together on a, on a business between those corporate jobs in downtown Toronto. And we had, you know, we made a, 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 finite time commitment to help another business set up franchise systems. And so we did that. And when that was finished, it was like, okay, now what? That's when we said, okay, off we go. Here it is. And we left Canada. So I was doing this editorial stuff and uh, working with with other authors on their books. And the part of the experience that I had there was 
these authors and I would work very closely together and we would end up with these fantastic manuscripts, in my humble opinion. Uh, and and I, I'm not saying that to blow my own horn, but to demonstrate that part of the challenge that faces any entrepreneur or anyone else who wants to write and publish their own book. Mm -hmm. So we would end up with these great manuscripts and then the authors would go away and embark on their self-publishing journey. And I watched them fall flat, be disappointed, not be happy with the results. The learning curve is too steep. The technological basis is continually changing. And, you know, they, for one reason or another, didn't have the experience that they wanted. So to get the book successfully mm -hmm. out in front of their audience. Right. Yeah. So John and I were kind of, Oh, well, instead of just doing ghostwriting or just editing manuscripts, we can help with this. And we had by this point written and published our own book, rock your business, you know, for people just starting out on their entrepreneurial journey, all the nuts and bolts and the basics that, that you kind of need to know. So we had just published our own book, self-published, of course. So we did the whole thing and we're like, totally see why it catches people up. But we didn't have anything else that we were busy doing where these other people were busy running their counseling practices or their, you know, mortgage broker business or whatever they were, whatever else they were doing. So we started to help authors with that self-publishing journey. And we were a service provider. So you give us a fee, we'll do the service and off you go. And we did that right up to the point of publish so that they would still manage the uploading to Amazon and other distributors and they would still do all of that. We would just get them to publish. And we watched the same thing happen where they would get to that point and then they, you know, for example, I would spend three to four hours live with each client walking them through how to get their book up on Amazon and how to get their book up on Ingram Spark. And we're like, this is crazy. So I've done it a bunch of times yeah. and they're doing it for the first time. So instead of having them go through all that angst, so we now do all that. Mm -hmm. And we've okay. totally gone into the hybrid publishing where we do all of that stuff, including support for the all important marketing bits, but we want to make it an easier point of entry. And so, you know, we split the royalties the with the authors getting have, being invested in the front end. Excellent. Yeah. So the, the last question that I have is I did ask what you found was one of the hardest things of making the decision. What is the biggest reward that you guys have felt over the last five years of making this, this decision to change your lives? That's a good question. I'm going to say exhilaration. We, for, for me, I love the, the freedom of, you know, I'm looking out on this beautiful ocean view right now. I, I, you know, and, and, when we're done recording here, I'm probably going to go and take a dip in the ocean because it's still warm enough. We've got another probably three weeks where we can still swim in the ocean. And two years ago, we made a decision to cut, get off the boat for a little bit of time. And we went and spent seven months in France. I'd never been to France. And we continued to work. We took our business with us. And, you know, so it's that exhilaration. It is, I feel, completely alive connected with the universe, connected with who I am. And I, I can't really imagine another way of doing things. Yeah. And it's a demonstration to me about if you set your mind to doing something that you are really passionate about, you can pretty much do anything, obviously within reason, but you know, we set ourselves up to go and live in Mexico. Great. And then we decided to go to France for seven months who would be crazy enough to do that? We did. And, and it was easy. And, and so, you know, things get easier and more fun. Yeah. Great benefit. No, that, yeah. That, that's fantastic. Very inspiring. Yeah. It, it, and I, I could talk to you guys for probably the rest of the day, but I mean, Bunny needs to go and have a dip and I <laughs> respect uh, our audience. Yeah. So, so that brings us to the part of the show where we ask all of our guests, 
We have six questions. We ask all of our guests the same questions. And it's usually kind of fun, and I'm sure it will be this time. So if you guys are ready, I would like to begin our uh, smart man, smarter woman version of uh, James Lipton's uh, Q&A from, uh, what was it, Actors Studio. So are you guys okay with that? Yes. We're ready. Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. First question. What one word best defines an entrepreneur? Fearless. Okay. And my word is opportunist. Okay, a fearless opportunist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I I cannot I there isn't one. That I I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Okay. And I've done so many different things in my life. I think I'd, I'd be happy and, uh, to uh, go back to being a musician and, and working in the music industry. Awesome. What profession would you like never to attempt? Medical doctor. Oh, that was mine. <laughs> medical yeah, doctor, lawyer. Where he's like, yeah, no. I lawyer, would not like to doctor, be a lawyer. Accountant. No, none no. of that. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What sound or noise do you love? Oh, oh I don't, didn't see that on the list. I love the sound of the ocean on the beach. Actually, there's a more specific sound. I'm sorry, did I just steal? No, go ahead. When you're standing on a rocky beach <laughs> and the waves are coming in, when the water goes out, the rocks all hit on one another and it makes this unbelievably gorgeous crackling Song. sound it's mm. beautiful mm. i would say that's my favorite sound and for me it's crashing waves yeah okay perfect Good picture what book would you recommend every entrepreneur should read uh, I'm going to start with that one. Uh, I read this book when I was, I think, 15, uh, Stephen J. Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful Entrepreneurs, Entrepreneurs or Pe People. People. Yeah. Amazing book, had such a huge impact in my life, and I still refer back to it you know, every day, every week, um, some of the principles in that book. Yeah, and my answer is that it is the one they write. Hmm. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the act of thinking about and going through the process of writing a book about your business or about your life, uh, but in particular about the business or related to the business, is that it is incredibly clarifying. You identify in a very concrete way your audience, you identify in a very concrete way the problem you solve for them, and you identify and articulate in a very clear way the solution to their problems. And I can't think of a better way to improve your business or the offering that you have for your clients. Excellent. Okay. And last question, when your own entrepreneurial journey is completed, what do you hope your legacy is? You know, my, my answer to that, when I was reading that just earlier, I said, my first reaction was, well, I'm never going to end my entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> Starters. Yeah, and then I had to yeah. take that to a next level and say, well, there's a couple of of levels of uh, legacy, and one of them is a, f a familiar or a family legacy, uh, uh, or what people think of me and what they would say about me when I'm not doing this anymore. And I hope that people would say that I always did the right thing as an entrepreneur, um, or and then, human. or as a human. And then on the other side of things is, what would I like to leave behind? I'd like to know and leave behind that I've touched as many people as possible in a positive way about their entrepreneurial journeys and their lives in a positive way. Excellent. And my answer is probably not thinking big enough, but when I read the question and reflected on what that, what, what my answer to that is, is quite probably basic. I want to leave behind, and like John, my entrepreneurial journey isn't going to be over until you're sprinkling my ashes out in the ocean. <laughs> but at that point, I want to have created something meaningful 
for my son and for for John's kids. And and that meaning, it may be economic or financial or emotional or, you know, lessons. And maybe it's mm-hmm. a little bit of all of those. But but I, I, I want to make sure that I leave my my son and our, our kids. Our siblings. Yeah, better sure. better for having us than not. Awesome. Those were awesome answers, guys. Thank you. Now, for those in our audience who would like to connect with you, they're ready to write their book and they need to connect with you. What is the best way for them to get in touch? Probably by email. Yeah. And the email address, my name, Bonnie, is spelt funny. It's B-O-N-I. And that is because my name is actually Bonita, which causes the Mexicans all kinds of grief (laughs) because Bonita (laughs) means beautiful. Nobody's name is Bonita down here. But anyway, so B-O-N-I at ingeniumbooks.com. Okay. And ingenium is I-N-G-E-N-I-U-M. Correct. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Would do you guys have any final thoughts before we conclude uh, our episode that uh, you would like to share with our audience of entrepreneurs? Ingenium, creative thinking, creative mind. Mm-hmm. That's the the meaning of the word ingenium and uh, how we came up with that was because we were all working or we were working in the creative realm of And we needed to bring creative ideas to the very practical matter of what do we want our life to look like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say embrace the creativity in all aspects of the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Awesome. And what about you, Juliet? Um, my wheels are spinning as to when we're moving. Yeah, <laughs> we're, 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 we're starting to pack, are we, tomorrow? <laughs> well, not not pack yet, but working out the logistics of how we could do this. Okay, terrific. And that brings us to uh, this episode's words of wisdom. And there were there were so many that, that I thought of that would be appropriate, but then I came across this one. And I thought, yeah, this is the one. And and this is uh, a quote that actually Will Smith said when he was playing Chris Gardner in the movie The Pursuit of Happiness, which was a great movie if you've never seen it. And he said, I think he was talking to his son when he said this, don't ever let someone tell you that you cannot do something. You've got a dream. You've got to protect it. When people cannot do something themselves, they're going to tell you that you can't do it. You want something, you go get it, period. I thought that was appropriate. That's great. I I love it. Great quote. Yeah. And um, so, again, thank you very much, guys. This has been awesome. The time has flown by. Uh, I'm sure there's much more we'd love to chat about. Thank you very much to my awesome co-host once again. As you know, I could not do this without you. But most importantly, thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in and for giving us a listen. We hope you found some value here today, and I'm sure you did. It certainly got probably got your wheels spinning a little. If you like the podcast, please subscribe. You can find us in all the regular places, iTunes, Spotify, or go to the website, smartmansmarterwoman.com. So thank you. Until next time, take good care of yourself and those that you love. Bye for now.